Okay, yeah. everyone, so let us uh, carry on. We have another hour or so, uh, and uh, I thought I would discuss a little bit more about the Buddha, just to give you some more ideas about uh, who the Buddha was and how to think about the Buddha, how to read the suttas, uh, uh, kind of with a idea of the Buddha at the back of your mind, because it makes the suttas come alive in a very different way, which I think is extraordinarily important and useful. Uh, then we can have some questions. I'm sure, hopefully, I don't know if you have any questions, but we'll find out soon. <laughs> and then we're going to have a little bit of the talk about the uh, Anukampa project, which is Venerable Chanda's uh, new monastery at the very end, just to she give her a chance to talk a little bit about that, because kind of why we are here in a sense, yeah, to kind of uh, <laughs> to sort of uh, support this project, which is a very interesting uh, project in so many ways. So we'll have a chat about that as well at the very end. Uh, but uh, for now, let's just talk a little bit more about the idea of Buddha Nusati, the recollection of the Buddha, and how to do this in a way that uh, kind of uh, works, yeah, that brings maybe some emotions up and some sense of connection to the Buddha and these kind of things, uh, so that uh, it actually has this effect that we can use it in our meditation practice uh, together with the breath and all of these kind of things. Uh. And one of the, uh, I think, very important things about uh, the Buddha is to understand that there are so many things about Buddhism that makes Buddhism unique as a spiritual teaching, very different from any, any other, really, of uh, humanity's uh, variety of spiritual teachings. And one of them I mentioned already is the fact that the Buddha is a person. Yeah? Almost all of the teachings, they have gods as the kind of figurehead or number one, numero uno is a god. <laughs> in us, the numero uno is a human being. That kind of makes it a very different kind of teaching. Yeah? And I think for that reason, we should be careful not to kind of elevate the Buddha into that position of God, because then we end up making the same mistake as the other religions. Yeah? We should keep those things that are unique to Buddhism, yeah? that makes the Dhamma special. Yeah? And we should value those things, because these are the things that... Uh, uh, give us, in a sense, a, to my mind, a preeminent place among all spiritual teachings in the world uh, because of these special aspects uh, to the teachings, uh, to these particular Dhamma teachings. Uh. So the Buddha is a, initially a human being who then perfects the human condition. Uh, it, Buddha can do that, we can do the same thing. We also start out as human beings, we have the possibility of going exactly where the Buddha went. Yeah? This is the promise of the Buddha. He did that, uh, we can do the same thing. Yeah? And this is one of those beautiful things. Uh, I'm now talking about the idea of faith a little bit, or confidence in Buddhism. The idea of faith uh, comes from the word sadha in Pali. Uh, yeah, sadha can be translated as faith, it can be translated as confidence, depending a bit on what angle you take. And, uh, but what again is unique about the Buddhist idea of faith uh, is that it is not different from wisdom. It is not different from understanding. Uh, in fact, it is very closely conjoined with understanding. So the more you understand about the Dhamma, the more insight you have, the more uh, realistic you are about the world, etc., etc., uh, yeah, uh, the more faith and confidence you have. Faith is just another aspect of wisdom. Uh, they two go hand in hand. Uh, this is another thing which is very unique in Buddhism, because uh, in other religions you often have the idea that faith is what matters, uh, and if it happens to go against reason, no problem as long as you have faith. Uh, but that is not how it is in Buddhism. It should always go along with reason. Wisdom, insight, understanding, and faith are two sides of the same coin. Uh, yeah, so these are some of these very, uh, uh, to me, very interesting ideas in Buddhism. And what we're talking about now is precisely confidence and faith in the Buddha. And it will evolve as you practice. It will evolve as you start to see things, as your way of looking at the world aligns with the way the Buddha looks at the, looked at the world. Then these things become even more powerful. Um, a third thing which makes Buddhism kind of unique and special is that it is a true world religion. It is a religion or a spiritual teaching that actually applies to everyone in any time at any place because it happens to be about fundamental aspects of human psychology. Human psychology is the same whether you live in ancient India, you live today, you live in this culture or that culture. At the core, we are 
very, very similar to each other as human beings. Uh, yeah, it's only the superficial stuff that is different, a bit of culture, a bit of these kind of things. Uh, but uh, at core, we are the same. Everyone wants to be happy. Uh, everyone wants to avoid suffering. Everyone wants to have a meaningful life. Uh, every, uh, we are all driven by certain defilements. Yeah? These things are true, universally true. Uh, and this is very different from most religions in the world are small religions. Uh, they are parochial. Uh, they are tied to a certain time and space. Uh, they are often an agreement, often called a covenant, uh, between a god and the people. Yeah? It's like the ancient Jews in the, in the, in the Middle East. Well, it, the, the god uh, Yahweh was their god, right? Uh, and they were kind of, he protected them and they, and they prayed to him. And all the other tribes, well, they have happened to have a different god, and that was the wrong god, but they thought the same thing about their god. And then the humans would fight down here, and the gods would fight in heaven. And it was kind of, everything was very small and parochial, and it was about our people and our connection to our little god up in heaven there somewhere. And the god was pretty much almost like a person, the way they behaved and the way they were, they were barely distinguishable from people, except they were a bit more powerful and these kind of things. So they're all small religions. They, are, they have no big vision of reality. It's just about protection and these kind of little things. Of course, then that god evolved in the history of Christianity and eventually became some kind of super god. But uh, it evolves from these parochial little things. Buddhism is the only teaching that has been universal uh, and has been kind of had this br large view from the very beginning. Uh. And uh, when you read the word of the Buddha, what is very interesting about the word of the Buddha, one of the things that he says in the suttas, uh, one of the things we know is that he talks about setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana, the first sutta of the Buddha. Yeah, setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. And so the Buddha, from the very beginning here, yeah, when he sets in motion this wheel, what he is doing, he's starting a teaching here yeah, that is not really stoppable in the world. The teaching has a certain momentum. Yeah. It has a certain force because it is so compelling. When people hear the Dhamma in the world, they practice it and they get the result and they pass it on to the next generation. It goes on from this, from century to century, to culture to culture, from land to land. And it cannot really be stopped because it is so compelling. People want to hear this teaching. Yeah. They understand that this actually speaks to me as a human being. Yeah. And so what that means uh, is that when the Buddha gave these teachings, uh, because he had this idea of setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, uh, he did not just teach the people in the audience in front of him. Uh, there was an audience there. There were monks, nuns, and lay people probably in front of him listening to his teachings. Uh, but when the Buddha gave his teachings, he had a much larger thing in mind. Uh, yeah, he knew there were people in South Croydon, yeah, or in Australia, or in Norway, or in Michigan, or, or whatever it is, or Germany, or whatever it is, yeah, coming together, listening to these teachings as there is now in the present day around the world. He knew this, and because he knew there would be people coming together in this way, he would phrase and articulate his teachings in such a way that precisely it would be universally applicable. It was like this from the very beginning. If you compare the Buddhist teachings to some of the other teachings that were contemporary of the Buddha, like the Upanishads and the Vedic teachings, the Vedic teachings are steeped in Indian culture. They are steeped in Indian mythology. It's impossible almost to understand what they are about. When you read them, it's like, what on earth is this about? And you have to decipher it. You have to have experts to tell you what's going on. But the Buddhist teachings are not like that. They are straight away understandable. Uh, the trappings of culture, if you want to call it that, are kind of largely, not, not entirely, because obviously he is speaking to an audience as well. Uh, but the culture is largely removed, uh, and what is left is core spiritual ideas uh, that are universally applicable. Uh, and what that means uh, when you read the suttas uh, is that the Buddha is talking to you. Uh, that's what it means. Uh, yeah, The Buddha is giving a universal teaching that's applicable to everyone in the past, the future, whatever culture you are in. It means that these teachings are given to you as well. You are just as much a direct disciple of the Buddha as were those people who were sitting there at the time and listening to him live. So when you read the suttas again, remember that. Yeah, you were 
in the Buddha's mind. Not you specifically, but any being at any time. And so for that reason, you are also included. You were in the Buddha's mind when he gave these teachings. And that kind of makes it really powerful. Yeah, you open the sutta, and now you are face to face. Well, not face to face, but word, word, face to word, or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> with the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha is right there. He's talking to you. So you are a disciple of the Buddha in a far more literal sense uh, than you might imagine. Uh. So when you again, when you come down and you read the suttas, reflect like that. Uh, here is the Buddha talking to you. The Buddha is thinking about you when he gave these teachings. He's coming purely from compassion, as I mentioned before. There's no vested interest apart from that. And he's giving you these teachings. Take these teachings really seriously. He's doing it out of compassion, for goodness sake. If there's something you don't like, something you find hard, remember it is coming from compassion and kindness. He is your teacher. So when you read the suttas with this kind of uh, mindset, uh, yeah, it opens up avenues, uh, it opens up ways of thinking about them uh, that you probably never ever uh, considered before. Uh, and it changes things, it changes your relationship with the text and with the Buddha himself. So this is how to think about these things, uh, to make things come alive. And there's one more thing that I usually say when I do teach retreats and things to make the Buddha come alive a little bit. Uh, and that is to imagine an encounter with the Buddha. Uh, what does it mean to have an encounter with the Buddha? Uh, how would that feel like? Uh, and you may think that if you had an encounter with the Buddha, you would feel a little bit nervous about it. Yeah? Here is this person with this enormous reputation uh, who probably can read your mind. Uh, and I don't know if you feel ready to have your mind read. Most people say, thank you very much, but no thanks. I'd rather not have my mind read. Uh, because it's kind of embarrassing. I always think this idea of having a screen above your head which kind of broadcasts all your thoughts to the world. Uh, uh, <laughs> if you're ready for that, then you're pretty cool, cool, pretty cool character. But most people are not ready for that. Yeah? They'd rather have a bit of privacy when it comes to their thoughts, uh, because uh, I think we probably think our thoughts are really embarrassing, even though there's nothing to be embarrassed about because we probably think exactly like everyone else, right? Sometimes you want to murder somebody. Sometimes we want to kind of do really kind of base things, you know, and sometimes we are very elevated. We, kind of, we, we are this complex people. Yeah? People are very complicated, all these sides to us. Uh, uh, but so there's probably nothing to be embarrassed about, but still, we probably would be a bit embarrassed. That's probably the reality of it. Uh, so uh, we'd rather not. So that's why the Buddha is a bit dicey to meet the Buddha, right? It's like, okay, <laughs> not really sure what's going to happen. Here's someone who has a reputation. You're not even really not sure if it's possible to read thoughts, but maybe it is possible to read thoughts. And if that is even remotely possible, then uh, it is scary. Huh? So imagine the Buddha is here. Yeah, maybe he comes to South Croydon. Huh? I don't know if this is a place where the Buddha would come to South Croydon, but maybe, yeah, the Buddha goes to all kinds of places. Uh, so imagine that he is somewhere in the, some little woods, yeah, nearby, because Buddhas usually hang out at roots of the trees, especially after midday, after having a meal or something, yeah. So the Buddha is there. You, has, you have heard that he's sitting at the root of the tree in one of the little woods out here. Yeah. So you kind of think, yeah, I've got some problems I want to talk to the Buddha about, yeah? Now I have the chance. Let me go and see if I can see the Buddha. <laughs> so you go to the edge of the woods and you walk into the woods. Uh, and as you walk into the woods, there's a little path going down the track. Yeah? You see a large tree down the track. Yeah? And you see a figure. Yeah? You see a monk yeah, sitting yeah, at the root of that tree. Yeah? And when you see that monk, you feel, wow, okay, you start to feel even more kind of nervous. Uh, because you know that now you are in presence, in the presence of someone very special, someone with an enormous reputation. You never met them before, but even just the stories that you've heard are kind of scary. So gradually, stage by stage, step by step, you walk closer to the Buddha. And as you come closer to the Buddha, you start to feel the presence of the Buddha. And the presence is peaceful. The presence is kind. The presence has a sense of benevolence about it. And I don't know if you have ever been to places in the world that feel very good. Sometimes you are in the presence of a person, or sometimes you go to a building where people have been meditating for a long period of time, and there's a feeling of 
peace, a feeling of power, a feeling of benevolence. Something beautiful is going on there. And you know that when you go into that building, when you meet that person. This is one of the reasons I love to sit next to Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm is not a compulsive talker at all. When I sit next to Ajahn Brahm, he doesn't say anything to me. And I don't say anything to him. And I just sit there and feel really nice. Yeah, Because it's nice to sit next to someone who just radiates benevolence and peace without having to talk to you. It's actually very beautiful. And it's like an old couple who have been married for all their life. They don't talk so much anymore because they've said it all and they feel at ease in each other's presence. And that's kind of beautiful. There's something nice about that. And this is one of the reasons I love to listen to Ajahn Brahm give Dhamma talks, even though I heard everything before. Actually, that's not, not even true. I haven't heard everything before. Huh? Because Adam Brahm always says things in a slightly different way. Huh? Especially if you ask him some uh, smart aleck questions. Uh, new, th- <laughs> new things can come out of it. Huh? But uh, there is something powerful about presences and about people. Huh? And so as you approach the Buddha, you start to feel that vibe of the Buddha. And so you calm down a little bit. Huh? And so you go closer and closer and closer. Huh? And the closer to the, you come to the Buddha, huh? the more relaxed you start to feel. You go all the way up to the Buddha, and you're kind of still a bit uncertain what to do, because you may not be a Buddhist, right? Or, or even, I mean, this is the Buddha, you, he's just arisen, he, you know, we, people don't really know how to behave around the Buddha yet. So you kind of go up to him and you kind of stand there, kind of a bit unsure what to do next. <laughs> and so the Buddha says, please sit down. And so you sit down. And the Buddha says to you, how are you? And you say, oh, all right. <laughs> and the Buddha says, have you come from afar? Oh, I come from South Croydon. And he says, are you, have you had something to eat? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And the Buddha says, well, why have you come? And he says, oh, I had an argument with my wife or my husband or whatever. And you, think, and you feel a bit weird. You feel a bit sheepish asking the Buddha. You have the biggest spiritual being in this world for this kind of ordinary question. What do you mean you had an argument with your wife? Yeah, go to someone else to ask about arguments with your wife. Yeah, this, I'm the Buddha. Yeah, don't mess with me in these kind of questions. But the Buddha doesn't do that, right? We know that already. The Buddha knows you are a human being. He knows the problems that human beings have. An argument with the people who are closest to us is often a very kind of natural part of how we live our life. So instead of dismissing you and thinking you are a fool, uh, the Buddha gives you some very simple advice. He says, oh yeah, I understand. Uh, Just be kind. Uh, Understand everyone is suffering. Uh, Sometimes we have bad communications with each other. Uh, We perceive the world in slightly different ways. There's no wonder sometimes we should actually have disagreements and things. Uh, So just be kind. Just have compassion. Uh, Go back uh, and ask your wife for forgiveness and see what happens. Uh, Or your husband for forgiveness or whatever. Uh, And then uh, you say, you don't know what to say, uh, but at this point uh, you understand the power of this being. uh, Not because the word of the Buddha has spoken are so very unique or special, they are nice, uh, but where they are coming from. uh, They're coming from this beautiful place of compassion and kindness and forgiveness and peace and acceptance, full acceptance for who you are, even though all you have are these ordinary human problems like everyone else has. uh, And there's something very powerful about that that impresses you in a very profound way. You know what it's like a little bit when you meet people like that. And so you bow down because you understand that you are in the presence of something beautiful. You want to bow down. Your whole body just now wants to bow down to this person. And the reason why you want to bow down to the Buddha is because all you see are these beautiful qualities. What is really painful is to bow down to someone with an ego. This is why we don't want to bow down to people in the world, because almost everyone has egos. And if you bow down to an ego, it's like you can be taken advantage of or something. But with the Buddha, there is no ego. There is no self. There's not someone who's going to take advantage of you. All you are bowing down to are these beautiful qualities. And you feel intuitively, as you bow down to the Buddha, that you are actually building up these qualities within you. Because if you bow down to good qualities, well, it means you respect them. And so you are building them up within yourself. And so you bow down and you just feel blissed out. Because you understand you've been in the presence of something extraordinary. And then you get up. And then you walk away. 
And when you walk away, you know that you will never ever in the rest of your life forget this experience. It's a positive trauma. It's imprinted in your mind once and for all. And when you walk away, you know that that simple teaching, you're going to carry it with you into the future to your meetings with other people, to enhance your ability to live well and to do all of those right things in the world. You never forget this idea, just be compassionate, just be kind. You take it with you and you, this is how you deal with people in all, from all walks of life from now on. So the Buddha is in a one way just an ordinary human being you can communicate with. But at the same time, someone who has these extraordinary qualities that make this powerful impact on you. It's so powerful that all you want to do is just to bow down to this person. And knowing that at that time you're building up those qualities within yourself. So something like that. So when you kind of, when we all bow down to the Buddha statue afterwards, yeah, something like that. It doesn't have to be exactly what I'm saying, but just to give you some idea. And then as you do that, hopefully you can feel some emotions with this. And these are the emotions that make meditation possible. These are the emotions that drive the Buddhist path, that motivates this whole thing here gives rise to the joy, the happiness. And we're just talking about the Anapanasati Sutta. This is where that happiness and joy come from. It's beautiful feelings, powerful feelings. And you take them on and on and on, all the way to the end of Anapanasati. All the way, we mentioned before, fulfilling the seven awakening factors and eventually going all the way to awakening itself. Based on some very simple principles, Right view, understanding who the Buddha is, uh, building up that joy, watching the breath, uh, building it up and up and up. And as you do that, eventually uh, uh, coming all the way to the end of the path. uh. So um, that is just some ideas uh, for you uh, to how to think about this and how to reflect on these things, uh, to make the Buddha come alive. uh, so he doesn't just remain some distant figure that we have no connection with, uh, but someone you can connect with in a more personal sense. Uh, so um, I think I have talked enough. Uh, perhaps I've talked too much, but certainly enough. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and uh, if you wish to ask some questions and uh, have a little bit of discussion or whatever, I'm very, very happy to have some discussion with you and if you disagree adamantly with some of the things I've said please fire away and do not be I'm happy to have to disagree here but um, whatever really so uh, is there anything anyone would like to say at this point uh, the, which one Daniel Gopala, da, da, Gopala, the rain that God would talk about Danya Gopala Sutta. Uh, which, where is that? Which collection is that? Uh, do you know which collection it is in? Uh, Danya Gopala. I know the Gopalaka Sutta in the Majima, but Danya Gopalaka? I'm not so sure. Gopala. Is, Gop- is it the Gopala Sutta in the Majima Nikaya? Uh, it's about the farmer, like uh, the Buddha went to this place where the farmer was uh, uh, like plowing, uh, uh, and relaxing. Uh, and then how you are good then? Oh, this is from the Sutta Nipata. Uh, okay, I think I know. I think I know the Sutta you're talking about. Danda Gopata. Okay, I think it's in the Sutta Nipata collection. Let me let me see if I can find the Sutta. Is there any, anything in particular about that Sutta that you are interested in? What What was the point you wanted to make? Yeah. Do you, is there anything in particular about that Sutta? How the Buddha kind of overcame that problem with uh, so he was the one who was uh, yes. hostile towards the Buddha, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, I think I think I remember now a little bit is coming back to me. Um, let me see if I can find something. Yeah. And then how the Buddha compared the. The difference between. Aha, Danya, Danya, Danya Sutta, the second Sutta of the Sangyutta Sutta Nipata. 
Okay, so I'll read it out for you, okay, just for, for a bit of fun. I've boiled my rice and drawn my milk, said Dania the cowherd. Dania the cowherd is Dania Gopalaka, right? I stay with my family along the bank of the Mahi. My hut is roofed, my fire is kindled, so rain sky if you wish. I boil not with anger and have drawn out hard-heartedness, said the Buddha. I stay for one night along the bank of the Mahi. My hut is wide open, my fire is quenched, so rain sky if you wish. Is this the one? Yeah. Yeah. No gadflies or mosquitoes are found, said Dania. Cows graze in the lush meadow grass. They get by even when the rain comes, so rain sky, if you wish. I bound a raft and made it well, said the Buddha, and with it I crossed over, went beyond and dispelled the flood. Now I have no need for a raft, so rain sky, if you wish. My wife is obedient, not wanton, said Dania. Long have we lived together happily here. I hear nothing bad about her, so rain sky, if you wish. My mind is obedient and freed, said the Buddha, long nurtured and well tamed. Nothing bad is found in me, so rain sky, if you wish. I am self-employed, said Dania, and my healthy children likewise. I hear nothing bad about them, so rain sky, if you wish. I am no one's lackey, said the Buddha, and with what I have earned, I wander the world. I have no need for wages, so rain sky, if you wish. I have heifers and suckling, said Dania, cows and calf and breeding cows. And I also got a bull, the leader of the herd here, so rain sky, if you wish. I have no heifers, heifers, how I pronounce it? Heifers and suckling, said the Buddha, no cows in calf or breed, breeding cows. I haven't got a bull, a leader of the herd here, so rain sky, if you wish. Um, okay, well, it goes on for a while like this. Uh, the stakes are driven in, unshakable, said Dania. The grass halters are new and well woven. Uh, not even the sucklings can break them, so rain sky, if you wish. Like a bull, I broke the bonds, said the Buddha. Like an elephant, I snapped the vine. I will never lie in the womb again, so rain sky, if you wish. Right then, a thundercloud rained down, soaking the uplands and the valleys. Hearing the sky rain down, Dania said this. If it is no small gain for us, it is no small gain for us that we have seen the Buddha. We come to you for refuge, seer. O oh, great sage, please be our teacher. My wife and I, obedient, shall lead the spiritual life under the Holy One. Gone beyond birth and death, we shall make an end of suffering. Your, uh, your children bring you delight, said Mara the wicked. Things are changing here. Okay, anyway, said Mara the wicked, your cattle also bring you delight, for attachments are a man's delight. Without attachments, there is no delight. Your children bring you sorrow, said the Buddha. Your cattle also bring you sorrow, for attachments are a man's sorrow. Without attachment, there are no sorrows. So that is the one you're referring to? Yeah, yeah? okay, good. I got, got, got the one. Okay, so uh, it's very nice, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that is the, how the Buddha kind of uh, brings people around her. Uh, so, uh, excellent. Uh, okay, any other questions or comments or anything? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, question about the Anapanasati meditation. Yes. Um, what is it in suttas which make you think that it is one of the main techniques of the Buddha taught? Um, well, f first of all, be uh, because the Buddha says he used it himself uh, to gain awakening. Uh, and then he says that other people should also use it for that purpose, uh, so specifically. Um, and usually the Buddha, he tends to teach what, he, what is kind of within his own experience, the way he did things, he teaches that, that to others. Uh. The second reason, because you find it in many, many places, yeah? the Anapanasati, you find it in the Majin Manikaya 118. There's a whole collection in the Sangyutta Nikaya on Anapanasati. Uh. It is mentioned in the number of other suttas like the Rahula, Maharuhulavada Sutta, the Sutta to Rahula, and in other places. So it's, quite, it's a common theme yeah, that you find in the suttas. Uh, 
It is also spoken about just like Anapanasati without explanation in a number of places, used for various purposes. And it is said to be the way to practice Satipatthana. Yeah? So Satipatthana is done through practicing Anapanasati. No other method is really given to uh, as fulfilling, uh, fulfilling Satipatthana. Anapanasati is the only thing that really is said to fulfill Satipatthana. So for these reasons, and for also because other meditation techniques are not taught very often in the suttas. Uh, for example, there are things like the Kasina meditations, yeah? are very rare in the suttas, even though some people enjoy and think this is important, they're not really taught very often. Huh? Uh, even things like, um, uh, you know, cemetery contemplations or uh, are very rare in the suttas. Uh, four elements, a little bit more, but also not that common. Huh? Yeah, and so uh, it really, uh, Satipat Anapanasati seems to be the only meditation technique that actually is complete in its own right. It takes you all the way from the beginning of the path uh, all the way to the end. Uh, and uh, so for this reason, it has a special place in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, and uh, it's also quite difficult sometimes to really understand how you are supposed to practice Satipatthana without a framework like Anapanasati. Uh, it's not clear. And as if you look around the world and you see kind of the various teachers, they have different interpretations of how to do it. So you have the Gwenka method is one interpretation of Satipatthana. You have Mahasi Sayado is another interpretation. You have Ute Janiya, uh, who, you know, another one. Uh, and you have uh, Paok Sayado. Many of these are Burmese. It's interesting how the Burmese kind of are the leaders of meditation systems. Yeah, there seems to be this. Uh, they seem to have this kind of systematization thing in Burma. Thailand is much more relaxed. They don't really have this kind of teach. Sri Lanka also doesn't really have these kind of systems in the same way. It seems to be a speciality of the Burmese for some reason. Uh, but um, all kind of systems are limited in view. Uh, and uh, so I think it's always useful to come back and to see how they compare with the system of the Buddha. And the system of the Buddha, as far as I can tell, is mostly mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, yeah. Bonte, one more question. Please, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, each section has a, a portion at the end of it which talks about impermanence, mm. arising and passing away. Uh, do you think when you do the Anapanasati as well, you should look at impermanence in each of the tetrads? Um, you can. Um, you, I, I think it's not, not wrong, yeah, so you can do that. I, you know, the, um, the four tetras in Anapanasati is on the last one. It talks about Anicca, Viraga, Niroda, Patinisaga. But I think that uh, not every time we practice Anapanasati are we going to go all the way to the end, all the way to the jhana, the, the, the first 12 factors. The, the 12 factor is Vimocheyang Chittang, which is liberating the mind. That's the 12th one. That, that means entry jhana, basically. Yeah. You don't have to go all the way to enter a jhana to do anicca and viraga nupassana. Yeah? You can do that also more from a lesser kind of depth of samadhi. Yeah? But the deeper the samadhi, the more powerful it's going to be. So you can do it after the four, first tetrad. It's probably not going to be very powerful. Yeah? Can I would, I would generally say you should go the deeper. The deeper you go, the better. Yeah? Um, the uh, very interesting about the Satipatthana Sutta is... Uh, how much has been added to that sutta over the uh, millennia, especially early on after the time of the Buddha. And it's a very interesting book called The History of Mindfulness, which I would never recommend to anyone unless you are extremely interested in reading suttas, because it's, uh, you really have to know your suttas well to be able to follow the arguments in that uh, book. Yeah. But I think it is a, a great, very interesting book. And it is a comparative study of the Satipatthana Sutta, the various versions of it. Some are found in Chinese translations, some are found in uh, uh, the Abhidhamma, and bring it all together and see what they have in common. And the result of that analysis uh, is that uh, Satipatthana, uh, Kaya Nupassana, is basically just the 31 parts of the body. And then it is the external, internal, and external, and internal contemplation. Uh, that's it. Very simple, right? Uh, or everything else may have been added after the time of the Buddha. It may not actually be as authentic. It may not be wrong, but it's not really what the Buddha had in mind when he talked at the Bhattana practice. So the arising and passing away, the, the Udayavaya aspect of the um, Satipatthana Sutta may have been kind of something that crept into the Sutta over time. The core aspect is Bahidda, 
uh, ajatta bahidda, ajatta bahidda, which is internal, external, and internal and external. Uh, 31 parts of the body relating to your body, relating to the bodies of others. Uh. And so when you start to do this kind of analysis, it uh, opens up a completely different way of thinking about the, uh, uh, the suttas, and it makes a very, very different kind of impact. Uh. So yeah, I may have lost you now a little bit, because this is kind of very, this is quite specialized, uh, but uh, it is fascinating. Yeah. Um, but regardless of all of that, uh, the, uh, the idea is you want to take the samadhi as deep as you can. The deeper it is, the more powerful your insight is going to be, precisely because things start to fade away and disappear. Uh, so that's kind of, I think, the, uh, the, uh, in the final, is in the, you know, when you look at it um, uh, in full, I think that is a, a safe conclusion regardless, uh, really. Uh, so, uh, yeah. You okay with that? Uh, yeah? Okay. Good. I'm glad because I'm uh, not sure what else to say. So. <laughs> Please, yeah. Bhante, it's about the Hanapana supplementation again. Mm. Uh, you mentioned about observing the uh, breath. You have been in detail uh, uh, observing about different types of breaths and then eventually to reach uh, uh, calmness. Yeah. And then you, you cultivate the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. And my question is, at that time, do we not have to uh, contemplate dhamma than arising of uh, five clinging aggregates and non-arising? And do we not have to think about this more, in more detail so that you always come across hmm. uh, impermanent uh, suffering yeah. as well as uh, non-self? Yeah. So, the yes, I, uh, the, uh, the way to... Uh, contemplate the five aggregates, the panchakanda, you know, the five personality factors, or however you want to translate it, is precisely what you do in the fourth tetrad of the Anapanasati Sutta. When you do the Anicca Nupassi, Viraga Nupassi, Nirodha Nupassi, Patanisagga Nupassi, that is the contemplation of the five aggregates. So uh, you can imagine that you have um, gone through a process of anapanasati, let's say you go all the way to step number 12, which is vimochayang chittang, liberating the mind. You have attained a jhana state. Uh, yeah? Let's say you go all the way there, just for the sake of uh, having some, you know, a real kind of example. Uh. Now, if you enter the jhana state, the body is gone. Uh, yeah? So when the body is gone, that is rupa, rupa kanda. Yeah? So you're contemplating rupa kanda. So when the body is gone, you come out of that jhana state, uh, you understand niroda. You understand the niroda of the body. The body is completely gone. You understand anicca. This is the highest kind of anicca when you have cessation of things. So you have, because the body has been gone during that state of jhana, you have full insight into what it, what the rupakanda disappearing, right? Well, not, not full insight because there's more to the rupakanda than the body, but you have a large part of rupakanda has already been understood. It is completely gone. You have full understanding of the anicca of the body here. You will never really cling to the body in the same way again because you have seen how the body can be completely gone. You also understand the dukkha of the body. Yeah? Because the body is gone, you're so happy. Wow, I had no idea the body was so much suffering, right? The body gone, whoa, the body. Yeah, get lost, body. You don't want anything more to do with you. Yeah? You, are, you are just terrible. I have no idea how terrible you were. Now I get it. Yeah? So you kind of chuck out the body a little bit more. Yeah? <laughs> And then you also know that the body is anatta, anatman, because when you are in a jhana state, you cannot access the body. The body is gone. You can't, there's no, you know, there's no access to it anymore. And at, whatever is atman is something you can always access by definition. If something is completely gone, it has nothing to do with you, it must be anatman, it must be anatta. So you are contemplating the five khandas, uh, the five personality factors, as according to the three characteristics, uh, in this way. Uh, you go through the process of meditation, you see how things disappear, gradually, gradually disappear, eventually be completely gone in cessation, then you have an insight into impermanence, dukkha and anatta as a consequence. The will is the same thing. As you go through the various stages of meditation on the path, uh, the will gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it's completely gone in deep samadhi, in the jhana. Then when you come out of jhana, you know the will is impermanent because it was completely gone. It's dukkha because you're much more happy without it. That is a big revelation, yeah? Because we tend to worship the will in this world, creativity, all these kind of things. The will is gone, it's better. Wow! That's kind of 
big time insider. It's non-self because the will was gone. You don't need it anymore. You are still here. You are kind of hanging out. Will is gone happily. Okay, non-self. And then you carry on like this with your perceptions. Certain perceptions are disappearing and changing. You know, there must be non-self, dukkha and impermanent. The feelings that you have, the, all the painful feelings are gone. Then certain happy feelings start to disappear. Again, you can contemplate them in the same process in the same way. Consciousness itself can also be contemplated through that process. So. Am I making any sense? Yeah. yeah? <clears throat> Finally, we have to get rid of our cravings. Yeah. Yeah. Process, yeah. So, <coughs> yeah. So, so then that happens when you go. It happens automatically. Yeah, because you see dukkha, you see more and more things are dukkha. Yeah, and eventually, and if you see something as dukkha, <coughs> you can't crave for it. You can't crave for dukkha. It doesn't make any sense. <coughs> and so you let it go. Yeah, and so you keep on doing this again and again and again. And eventually, because you cannot crave dukkha, eventually. Craving is destroyed because uh, you <coughs> it's just uh, you know you, you can't hold on to these things. So. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, from day to uh, you gave um, a very, very small joke um, when yeah. you start uh, this session mm. and you talked about the, some of the qualities that could come about and uh, yeah. so um, my question is like um, when you develop these qualities um, yeah. If you feel you feel like uh, boring and uh, need kind of a um, uh, variety, uh, need 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 for it, and then the conceit will arise as well. So how can I how can I deal with that? Because it's it's feel like um, a boring feeling uh, when when uh, developing these qualities. Which, which qualities do you mean? The qualities of the Buddha? Uh, no, um, oh. Like um, forgiveness and um, uh, yeah. uh, I mean like um, giving more forgiveness. Yeah, is that um, bo boring? Really? Okay. It's feeling boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe you need to... I, I think... I don't... I don't think forgiveness has to be boring. Yeah, I think it can be... It, it can be a very beautiful quality actually. Yeah. I think if you... Uh, maybe you... Treat, need to try to another way of doing it, maybe. Yeah. Because uh, if you forgive, uh, it's actually very liberating. It's a beautiful, freeing feeling of the heart. Uh, because before you have forgiveness, you feel maybe a bit of resentment or anger or ill will or whatever. Uh, and suddenly you forgive and it's all gone. Wow! Then you can have metta and compassion instead. Uh, that's what forgiveness does when it really works. Uh. Uh, yes, yeah, so when you do yeah. that uh, for a long period, um, mm -hmm. so there will be a boring... Um, Kind of a, a anger um, underneath that uh, that uh, the long process. So how uh, in order to like overcome that in in inside meditation, mm. uh, just seeing it and just knowing it, noting. But um, sometimes we like conceit and the uh, the uh, greed uh, will um, play a role in there as well. Okay, so, well, first thing I would say is that if you're going to forgive, you have to kind of think about people in the right way. I think that's more important than seeing it in, in meditation or whatever. And I would say that the way to think about people is to remember that they're all conditioned. Yeah? People are what they are because of their past, because of their conditions, because of their past lives, because of how they were brought up, because of their teachers, because of all this myriad of conditions that work on us. We are who we are. And the more you understand that people are conditioned to be the way they are, the more you understand actually there isn't much free will. They, can't, they don't really choose to be the way they are. Yeah? They are the way they are because of conditions. They are trapped. And once you understand that people are trapped by the way they are and that they don't really want to be nasty, but they're still nasty, even if they, yeah, they just are nasty because of conditions, you start to be able to have compassion for them because you understand that they have a problem. Yeah, they are trapped in this kind of personality. They're trapped in this kind of conditioning. How can you be angry with someone who is in prison? Someone who is trapped? Someone who doesn't know what they're doing? Someone who's blind? Someone who's deluded? Someone who thinks they are creating happiness for themselves but actually creating suffering for themselves? Because the person they are hurting the most is themselves. Whether they hurt other people, maybe they do, maybe they don't, depending on how the other person reacts. But they're certainly hurting themselves, and big time. Yeah. Not small time, 
big, big, big mega time. And uh, so for that reason, when you start to get that, that actually they have no idea what they're doing, yeah, you start to have compassion for them. Instead of feeling, oh, they are, they're doing bad things towards me. Me, me, me. Yeah, it's kind of small me world. Yeah, you turn the table, you have compassion, your mind expands out and it kind of brings people in. And that kind of, this is a very beautiful thing when that happens. So it's about, this is more important. This is the way to do forgiveness and compassion. Yeah, to learn to look at other people in the right way. You look at anger in meditation. Okay, that can be helpful because you can see the cause of the anger. You can see what the problems are. But you really need to develop an alternative way of thinking about things. Uh, yeah? This is what we talk about right view as the foundation for the whole path, developing your perception. This is a very important part of that. Uh, and if you do this fully, there will come a time when you don't really get angry with people anymore. Yeah? Because you see everyone as uh, trapped in a sense. Everyone is in their own prison. Huh? Yeah, that's it, their personality. We're proud of our personality. But actually, it's not to be proud of. It's a prison you're in. That's your personality. And so, uh, yeah, so this is uh, then how you gradually change. Uh, and then, of course, you forgive people, yeah, because they are trapped. They don't know what they're doing. Of course, you, you, instead of being angry with them, you want to help them, yeah, because you realize, actually, they have a problem. How can I help them? Okay, listen, friend, yeah, look at it this way. Yeah, I, there's no need to be upset with me or angry with me or do bad things, you know, because, because of whatever. And you come from your heart and you come from compassion. And maybe they will listen to you because they realize that you're coming from a good place. And so you forgive, yeah, through understanding things in the right way, in this way. This is more important. And, but you need to reflect on this again and again and again. And as you do that, you, um, you make, you create that ability to forgive and to have compassion in the world. And it's not boring at all. It's a beautiful thing when that happens. Uh, but uh, it's important to do it in a way that is truly effective. Uh, and I think sometimes these meditation techniques may not be that effective. Uh, it's about right view, to my mind, which is the most effective way of doing this. Uh, I'm talking, when I say these things, I'm talking from the suttas. Uh, this is how the Buddha said, uh, or actually this is from the Venerable Sariputta in a very well-known sutta, talks about how to overcome anger called the Agata Pativinya Sutta, uh, Anguttara Numerical Discourses 5, number 162. I teach a sutta all the time, I know exactly where it is. Uh, so that is, uh, that is what I would uh, recommend. Uh, yeah. Was there something else that you wanted to say? Uh, what the, there was... Yes, uh, I think uh, the conceit... I'll conceit, yeah, that was, that was what I wanted to respond to as well. I, I forgot. I got, so, yeah, conceit. So the other thing that is important here is to remember that uh, sometimes people think if I am generous, I am compassionate, uh, then I am better, right? Uh, the other ones, they are kind of the low, I have compassion towards you because you are kind of a dodgy character, yeah? So I'm kind of superior to you, right? <laughs> this can very easily happen, yeah? Or, or a beggar in the street, I have the money, I give to you, you were the beggar, okay, so I'm better, or whatever it is. Uh, but... Um, this is, uh, uh, the problem is that uh, we are always changing positions in the world. Uh, in the past life, you were the beggar. Uh, in the next life, you may be the beggar, and the beggar may be feeding you. Uh, so who is better? We're always swapping positions in this world, always moving around. There's no kind of stable state that we are in. Uh, we're always changing from being this nationality, that nationality, this religion, that religion, wealthy, poor, educated, uneducated, stupid, smart, handicapped, non-handicapped, uh, and you can even take in animals if you want. We're always moving around. So who are you? Uh, you don't know who you are after a while. So how can you judge the other person if you don't know, even know who you are yourself, who the other person is? Uh, maybe they have some very powerful underlying qualities. Uh, maybe that beggar on the street is the next Buddha. If you think the beg beggar on the street is the next Buddha, how are you going to treat that beggar? Suddenly, you look at a beggar in a completely different way, right? Uh, it's like, wow, okay. Oh, master, you bow down to this beggar <laughs> afterwards. Uh, you give him a big meal, take him to the best restaurant or whatever. I don't know what you would do. Uh, so that's, you can see how your perceptions are. We are trapped in this idea of self, of personality. Uh, and this is why we judge people. Uh, we think that we know what the other person is, but actually we don't. We are just uh, following along the sense of self, and that is what makes us do these things. Uh, so there's no, being conceited is just uh, silly. It doesn't make any sense, uh, because it's just part of the delusion of self. That's where it comes from. Uh, and that permanence that uh, uh, is 
that which is that delusion is uh, is actually leading us astray here. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to pass the microphone on to Venerable Channa because uh, now we're going to talk <laughs> about uh, Anukampa project. Is that right? So, firstly, a uh, very uh, heartfelt thanks to Ajahn Brahmali for your wonderful Dhamma teachings today. Uh, so, such a relief, isn't it, to realize that we're all conditioned and none of this is personal. We're just kind of rolling along. Um, yeah, the phrase, uh, blinded by delusion, addicted to wanting, came to mind. Oh. And yet we're here together to try to break some of those delusions. and. Um, yeah, turn our wantings into a different direction away from the sensory world. So really warm thanks to you and to everyone who's come here. Um, it's a kind of small and intimate group, not that small, but sometimes I think that, you know, having a kind of closer group of people who really practice together creates a wonderful atmosphere. And uh, it's really heartening to see many of our supporters for the Anukampo project here. Uh, many of you have stayed with us and also come to Ovadana, which is great. And um, <clears throat> it just struck me when you were speaking towards the end about uh, the importance of reading the suttas to understand the Buddhist path and the Buddhist teachings, that this is one really fundamental kind of uh, um, essential aspects of being able to practice because it's the start of right view. But another really important part of practice to me is also the relational aspect of the Dhamma. And I think this is kind of what we're trying to do with Anukampa. So on the one hand, um, we're a British charity, for those who don't know. And on the one hand, a charitable aim that we have is to spread the teachings of early Buddhism. So to establish that right view and some meditation teachings. And on the other hand, to develop a monastery. Uh, particularly the first place in England where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. And I think even Ajahn Brahmali was surprised yesterday when I reminded you that it's the first and only <laughs> in England, and um, I'm the only bhikkhuni in England, which is not um, some accolade to myself. It's rather a surprise, isn't it, to know that there's only one fully ordained nun in this country. And at the moment, my dear venerable sister, who's come over from Perth, so there's two of us here right now. But uh, I think the beauty in starting a monastery is that it offers a place for people to put all the factors, to put drops in the jar, if you like, of every factor of the Eightfold Path. Because we actually start to apply the Dhamma. We start to apply our understanding. And in particular, to do that through the relational aspects, through serving one another, through developing wholesome perceptions of one another, learning to speak to each other in kind ways, in forgiving ways, gentle ways. And with that as a basis, with that harmony and that um, spiritual friendship as a basis, we have time to practice in solitude as well. And this is what um, I'm trying to create, basically, a, such a place where we can actually practice every aspect of the path leading to samadhi and hopefully leading to wisdom as well. So um, for those who have been following us for a while, but who I haven't seen for uh, probably a few years, uh, we started this project in 2016 with Ajahn Brahm's first visit to the UK. And uh, I organized, I've been organizing these tours for years now, but that tour reached at least a thousand people. And we also reach, this, this talk is gonna reach at least a thousand people through our YouTube channels and all the rest. And uh, in all that time, we've been trying to raise donations, let's say, towards having a place, a physical place that um, I can dwell in, in England, to keep me here, and uh, <laughs> hopefully not a prison. And also um, to create a monastery in the end where women can ordain and where everybody, whether you're male, female, transgender, green, black, whatever, I don't care, you can all come and practice. And so we managed to procure a property uh, last July, and I moved in in November. So we have a place now in Oxford. And that's, in a way, the center of where all this work comes from. So the office is very important. We've painted it nice, relaxing colors. And, uh, and the volunteers that we have are our biggest asset, I would say, as well as the trustees. One ex-trustee here and one new trustee at the back. And many people who've come and spent time 
Matthias and Grace, who's looked after us, and Sean, who's stayed for some time. And so everybody's welcome. So I want this to be a place where everyone can come and also learn the Dhamma through seeing how we can learn to treat each other well. You know, a place that's safe, a place that you can ask your questions without being shy or feeling ridiculed in any way. You know, you can actually come and have some contact with the monastics and maybe see the way that we try to live and treat each other. And, you know, we're very human, so I always tell of my mistakes and my struggles, and I think this also makes uh, the path seem accessible to people because, you know, we're all on the path together. I mean, I'm on the path, you know, hopefully. <laughs> I'm certainly trying to put one step, you know, in front of the other, sometimes half a step and then half a step. <laughs> But uh, we're growing together as a community, so I feel like today was very special in that sense. Uh, really nice energy in here, especially while we were eating our lunch, and I noticed no, no one was getting distracted. I'd have been like, what are they eating? <laughs> but you're all just meditating. It was really peaceful. So thank you for coming. And uh, hopefully, yeah, we can continue to practice together. And even if you can't make it to Oxford, we have lots and lots of programs online. So, of course, you can come to Oxford and book in for Dana, as these wonderful ladies have done and will continue to do. And, uh, and also you can join our online programs. You can also stay over as well as guests if we have space. But uh, amazingly, we're already getting a little bit small, a little bit um, tight on space. So the more demand, the bigger we can grow. <laughs> So welcome you all. And uh, yeah, our YouTube channel, just for the sake of the recording or for anyone who doesn't know, is Anukampa Bikuni Project. Uh, our website is www.anukampaproject.org. And if you go to the events page, you'll find that Ajahn Brahmali has a lot more talks in the next couple of weeks, uh, a retreat which is fully booked, but still a lot of space at all his talks. And Ajahn Brahm will come again in November for a couple of weeks as well. And uh, we have ongoing uh, sessions throughout the year. So, yeah, hopefully we can con continue to make the teachings accessible and welcome you all to, to be part of this. So thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, take care. Did you want to say yeah, a yeah, few I'll, more words? I'll finish off. So just, I just wanted to say very quickly, thank you very much, Venerable, for organizing all of these things, because uh, I think what we all want to do is to have more Dhamma in the world, uh, and that's what is happening. Yeah, Dhamma is for the benefit of everyone, for oneself and for everyone else. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that it is very difficult uh, to start a monastery uh, by oneself like this. Uh, Ajahn Brahm has done that, but Ajahn Brahm is superhuman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying Ven Prasanna is not superhuman, yeah. but uh, I'm just saying that Abraham is not male. Is a, not male. That makes yeah. it more difficult, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, but it is a very difficult thing to do, and it's a very brave thing to do. Uh, and it's very kind of, it takes a lot of uh, energy and commitment, all these kind of things. And it's amazing that uh, she has been going on for already for seven years with this project. It's kind of extraordinary, yeah. I don't know what, I can't remember what I thought at the time. I, I don't, I don't usually, I'm quite positive. I don't usually think negative, so many negative thoughts. I probably thought, yeah, good on you, whatever. But still, it is still <laughs> amazing that she has been going for so long with something that has turned out to be, not surprisingly, <laughs> quite difficult. So it's wonderful that you are all giving your support to the best of your ability. It's great. It is very important that we have bikinis in the world. So we have that sense of balance. Uh, when, when Buddhism spreads in the world, it goes from one society to another, it is important that we adapt Buddhism to the new societies. Uh, and one of the very important things now in the West is a sense of equality. Gender equality is one. All kinds of equalities are becoming very important, obviously. But gender equality is certainly one of them. Uh, and so I think uh, it's very important that we try to support the bikinis and I would try to have that equality. Traditionally, historically, it's always been more difficult to be a bikini than a bikini. Always. Uh, always been less, getting less support. Uh, there seems to be something in the human psychology that makes this happen. I'm not sure exactly what or how, but it uh, seems to be the way things are here. Yeah. So uh, again, so thank you very much everyone for coming and I encourage you to help in whatever way you can and I will also be happy to help. I think it's uh, one Personally, I 
I think is a wonderful thing that is happening. And uh, of course, in Perth, we are also trying to do the same thing here because it is an important part, very important part uh, of the four pillars of Buddhism, the four assemblies. Uh, the beginning is one, and now we're bringing back some balance again in Buddhism, which is wonderful. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, hopefully see you again at some point. Uh, Shall we end up the retreat by doing the Arahang Sama Sambuddha? Is that nice? Yeah? To pay quick respect to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. If you don't know this chanting, this is a traditional chant they do in Thailand. I don't know if, how well known it is among Sri Lankans, but uh, Arahang Sama Sambuddha. And so just follow along to the best of your ability. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagavan Bodhang Sepati panno bhagavato savaka sango sanghang namah.